Amen. Well, we welcome you today, and we welcome especially our guests that are with us today. If you're worshiping with us for the first time, we'd love to invite you after the service to join us in the Welcome Center and receive some information regarding all of the services and ministries here at First Baptist, but welcome. And also, by way of internet, for those of you who are joining us there, we welcome you as well. If you need some more information regarding First Baptist, you can go to our website and drop us an email there, and we'd be glad to talk with you that way. In your bulletin this morning, you see a, uh, a, a slide out regarding some changes that we're making to the bylaws. Our bylaws require that we inform the church two weeks prior, two weeks in a row prior to the next church conference, and uh, we invite you to take that information home and read it. It's based uh, basically uh, changing a couple of things on the way that we select deacons and their term of office and things like that. You can read through it, make some notes, and uh, be prepared to discuss and vote on that in our April conference. We're delighted to have Dr. Robert Shaw and his wife Eva with us today. They are from Garden City Chapel, and he'll be preaching God's Word today in the absence of our pastor, who is uh, fishing somewhere in North America. Now, I have a question for you. You want some great news today? God's Word is great news and good news, but I've got some great news to share with you today. As of Thursday this week, our church is debt-free. Because of your faithfulness in giving, we've been able to pay our debt off $1.7 million from its start in six years. And so the bank's not happy, but I'm happy. Amen? And so to celebrate that this morning, we're going to stand and sing the doxology, I just messed up Morgan's world. But we're going to stand together. I know it's COVID season, but we're going to stand together and we're going to praise the Lord together with the doxology and just sing our hearts to the Lord. Okay. Of 
and earth, Lord of heaven and earth, and hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth, hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth, hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy, the universe declares your majesty, you are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth. Amen and amen. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. And if you ain't excited about coming and worshiping our Lord Jesus Christ, I just, I, I just ask that you just stand up and give us about 20 or 40 jumping jacks. How about that? I mean, let's wake up, man. Hey, we have been walking our students through Proverbs for the past five to six weeks, and we have not gotten out of chapter one or two, which is a great thing. But Considering our Bible verse uh, for memorization this month, I just want you to hear some things that you and I need to, to do. And it says here in Proverbs 2, this is the father talking to the son, and he says, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments um, with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasure, then. It's a condition. If you do this, then. We need to be responsive to God's Word. Not only do we need to be responsive to God's Word, we need to be receptive to God's Word. We need to hide His Word in our hearts so that when the time comes, the Holy Spirit will act upon it and we'll know exactly what to do. We need to make our ear attentive. We need to pay attention to God's Word. But we need to seek it and search it with all of our heart. It says, then you will. That is a promise. You will understand and find the knowledge of God. All this as we see the father trying to speak to his son that it builds up to verse 5 in Proverbs chapter 3. And he says simply this, My son, you and I trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding but in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll make your straight. He'll, he will make straight your paths. Would you read with me our memory verse for the month of March? All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And all God's people said. Amen. Sing isn't the name. Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? And all the world can come to Him and have the sins removed. Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? Beautiful 
Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? Son of God and one of us, the lover of our souls. Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? Eternal King, you reign forever. And we will sing the glory of your name. Be lifted high for all the world to see. Your name is all they need. Your name is all we need. Isn't the name of Jesus powerful? Isn't the name of Jesus powerful? Chains are broken when it's spoken. Every knee must bow. Isn't the name of Jesus powerful eternal king you reign forever and we will sing the glory of your name be lifted high for all the world to see that your name is all they need your name is all we Eternal King, you reign forever, and we will sing the glory of your name. Be lifted high for all the world to see, your name is all they need, your name is all we Cause there is freedom in the name, the healing in the name, there is power in the name, salvation in the name, there is life in the name, there is no other name but Jesus, Jesus, there is freedom in the name. There is healing in the name, there is power in the name, salvation in the name, there is life in the name, there is no other name but Jesus, Jesus, there is in the name there is life in the name there is no other name but Jesus and isn't the name of Jesus all we need and isn't the name of Jesus all we need the way, the truth, the life, the only way to God, isn't the name of Jesus all we need, He's the way, the truth, the life, the only way to God, isn't the name of Jesus all we need. The name of Jesus. Will you say his name with me? Jesus. Oh, do you know what happens to our enemy when you say the name of Jesus? He shakes and quivers. All hell shakes and quivers. You know that little story in the Bible where the demons come out and say, oh, we know who Jesus is. Oh, if they know him, why don't we know him even more or at all? Question for you. Do you know Jesus? If today were to be your last day on earth, 
Would your first breath and eyesight be breathing heavenly air and seeing Jesus and being welcomed in as a good and faithful servant? You only can do that by trusting in that name, which is above every name, the only name by which we can be saved. Amen? If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, don't leave here today without someone showing you the way, the truth, and the life. Will you say his name again with me? Jesus. Heavenly Father, it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we come boldly before your throne. We bring our worship to you today with all that we have because we love you. And we really don't want to be anywhere else but sitting at your feet, worshiping you, and being blessed by your presence and to be filled by your spirit and to know that you're working all things to our good to those who are called by you. Jesus, if there's someone here today who doesn't know or understand or doubts that they are saved, speak to their heart by your spirit. And may they seek someone today that can show them that you alone are the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you, Lord, for the beauty of your word and the way that it does speak and teach and rebuke. And thank you, Lord, that we receive it in that manner. And thank you that we get to share your word with everyone that we know. Father, may we never, ever be ashamed of the gospel. And even in this day in which we live, it is all too important that we share that good news, even as Esther did for such a time as this. No matter the cost of what it would be to share the good news of Christ, there's always been a cost to sharing the truth. But in the name of Jesus and in that power, we go to all the world teaching and baptizing and making disciples so that from every tribe and tongue and nation and people, we can gather around your throne and sing, isn't the name of Jesus magnificent and beautiful and wonderful and saving. Meet with us here in this place today. Speak through our pastor, Robert, today your word into our hearts and from our lips to the ears of others that they may know Christ lives. Whatever it is that we need, Father, you meet that need according to your riches and glory and the plans that you have for our lives. We give you our highest praise in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, this day. And all of God's people say, change plans fail you look for love on a grander scale storms rise hopes fade and you place your bets on another day when the goal
Amen. Well, I'm glad to be here. What, what an awesome time of worship. What a great voice. Thank you for leading us in that. Um, and I'm proud of you. It was daylight savings time, and you're not here for the second service. You're here for the first service. There's going to be people in the second service that showed up for the first service and found out they were at the wrong service, right? This is a special place for me. I love First Baptist Georgetown. You probably don't remember this. Some of you weren't here then, but I was actually the interim youth pastor here. Did you know that, Jack? Not for very many weeks. It was in between a couple of guys, and they got somebody, but I would drive down from Merle's Inlet and speak to the youth on Wednesday night. Ted and I were in seminary together. Your pastor and I were in seminary together. He and my wife were in college together, and he has become a very dear friend that I, I really do love Ted. I appreciate his faithfulness to the Word of God. You are blessed when you come to this church, you're going to hear the Word of God. My family will ask me sometimes, what are you preaching on in the morning? I said, I'm preaching on the platform. They say, no, what are you preaching about? I said, about 30 minutes. But I can tell you this, when you hear your pastor teach and preach, you're hearing the Word of God. You're not hearing somebody's opinion, you're hearing the Word of God exposed to you straight from God's Word. I've had the privilege of going to India with Ted. And I love traveling with him through the airports and staying in the hotels and sharing the platform with him in places all over India. I also had the privilege of baptizing two of our children in this baptistry. So this is a special church to me. So thank you. I say thank you for the privilege of being here today. And of course, some of you are thinking, we didn't vote on that. Well, it's been such a great service up to this point. I'm going to try not to mess it up, Jack. Is that all right? 
And sitting on the front row, I was thinking, how am I going to start my message today? And God gave me a, a line, and then Pastor Keith stole it. I've got good news. And it's not about saving money on insurance. It's not even about paying off a debt, but I want to tell you what, that's good news, isn't it? How many churches can say they paid off debt during COVID? People are out of work, incomes have been cut back, things are tough everywhere. So you, you ought to know God has poured out a blessing on this place to be, to be able to say this morning, we're debt free. Well, I've got good news and it's this, we have hope. I was listening to Christian radio a few weeks ago, and somebody said somebody has defined hope as nothing more than unmet, the delayed disappointment. Hope, hope is nothing more than delayed disappointment. I got to tell you what, that's not true. We've got hope. We've got hope. We have a risen Savior who's in the world today. We have a risen Savior who's coming back, and He indwells in us today. And He's here in this place this morning. What do you hope in today? When you hear the word hope, what do you think? I was raised in the South, grew up in Macon, Georgia. So if you're not from the South, I'm going to tell you a phrase that's going to explain some things about Southerners. If you invite somebody to church and you say, are you going to be at church Sunday? And they say, I hope so. They're not coming. If they say, I'll try, they're still probably not coming. That's, that's just in, that's a polite way in the South to say, I hope so, to mean, I'm not coming, but I don't want to hurt your feelings. We've got hope. What are you clinging to this morning? I heard a story about a Little League baseball game. Older gentleman walks up to the center field fence, and he's watching the game, and he starts a conversation in between pitches. If you've ever been to a Little League baseball game, there's a lot of times there's a big gap in between pitches. So he's talking to the center fielder, and he said, well, how's it going? Center fielder said, we're losing 18 to nothing. And the gentleman in the outfield said, well, don't give up hope. The guy said, oh, I hadn't given up hope. We hadn't batted yet. (laughs) Seemed like it took a while for that to wave across the congregation. (laughs) Let me share our passage of Scripture with with you this morning. This is the book of Hebrews. Chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Therefore, I want to stop right there. There's some phrases in this passage that blow me away. When you hear the word therefore and the word since, the writer's making a case for what's come before that. And you know, if you see the word therefore in Scripture, you need to find out what it's there for, correct? So we're going to find out what it's there for, but I just wanted to stop and keep you on the same page with me. Therefore, brethren... Since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us, and you're going to see three lettuces this morning, let us draw near with sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Therefore, brethren, therefore, since we have confidence literally assurance, all outspokenness, to enter the holy place. I want you to think about that a minute. The book of Hebrews is written to former Jews, some who profess faith in Christ now, some who are thinking about professing faith in Christ, some who are struggling in their faith in Christ. But you have confidence to enter the holy place. What does that mean? That means the presence of God. I want you to think about that for a minute. For the Old Testament priest. What kind of confidence did they have to enter the holy place? I want to say to you, the the high priest got to go in one time a year. And I'm not sure that you went in with a lot of confidence because you knew, I may die in here. 
Nadab and Abihu, if you look at Leviticus chapter 10, walked into the presence of God with unauthorized fire. They shouldn't have been in there. Do you remember what happened to them? They were consumed with fire. We're told that the high priest, when he entered into the holy, holy place, would have a rope tied around his ankle, bells on his robe, so that if they heard the bell stop and he had died, nobody's going in to get him out. You would drag him out by the rope. Why? Because the holy place represented the presence of God. I want that thought to stick in your mind because it's going to make more sense to you in a minute. But you have confidence to enter the holy place. Why? I'm not the high priest. Why do I have confidence to enter the holy place? It tells you in the next line. By the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus. Not on their merit. Remember as a teenager growing up, I thought, you know, if i got to teach a Bible study in a few days, i got to make sure I'm real good for the next couple of days. Why? Because then I would feel like I was worthy to stand up and speak. Let me say something to you. On my effort, I'm never worthy. Ever. I'm never worthy, even though I've been to seminary. I have two degrees from seminary. I'm a pastor. I've got perfect attendance at church. None of that makes me worthy to enter the presence of God. But what does? The blood of Jesus. You can't enter on your own merit. In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, it says, there's going to be people that come to Jesus one day and say, Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. You could be the most religious person on the planet, but if the blood of Jesus has not been applied to your life, you have no right or access to the throne room of God. So we enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way. I want to stop there a minute. The way we enter now is new. It, there was an old way. You back up into chapter 10, and I won't take time to read all the verses, but what the writer of Hebrews is describing in chapter 10 is the way the high priest, the way the priest every day in the temple approached Jesus, excuse me, approached God, approached the holy place. Verse 4, if you got your Bibles, just look at verse 4, I will read that. What did the priests do in the temple? They offered sacrifice. We had one day a year called Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, and it was the day that the priest had to offer sacrifice for his own sins, wash himself, put on special garments, and then... By offering sacrifice, he could enter into the presence of God. But did you know they offered sacrifice every day in the temple? But listen to the sadness of verse 4. It is impossible for the, for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So why did they do it? It was prescribed by God to do it that way. But what was it doing? The priest was doing this every day, but it was pointing to something coming that was a new and living way. It wasn't going to be the blood of bulls and goats. It was going to be the blood of Jesus that gave us access. Can you imagine the frustration of walking by the temple day after day and seeing smoke arise and realize, we've got to do that again tomorrow? Even Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, that one day a year that the sins were forgiven. In your mind, you're thinking, we've got to do this again. This has got to happen again next year. We've got to have another Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. When Jesus died on the cross, what was one of the last things he said? It is finished. He had fulfilled the prophecy and the promise of God. He had fulfilled the Old Testament system of sacrifice. He had once and for all paid the penalty for our sin on the cross. It's finished. We don't need another Yom Kippur. We don't put Jesus back up on the cross. If the blood has been applied, you have access to the Father. Look at verses 11 through 14, further, further illustrating this. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, watch this word, which can never take away sin. All it did was cover it, it didn't take it away. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus finished the work and sat down. Why do you sit down? You sit down because you're finished. Now studying this passage, has there ever been a time that you saw in the New Testament where Jesus stood back up? Who said it? Stephen. 
I can't tell who's talking. You've got mask on. I can't read lips. You remember when Stephen was being put to death? It said he looked into heaven and he saw Jesus standing. But before that and after that, he is seated at the right hand of the Father because his work is finished. We have access by a new and living way. Inaugurated through the veil. A lot of Old Testament imagery here, but you've got to understand this. Inaugurated through the veil, that is his flesh. You remember the veil in the temple? I've read that scholars said it was a four-inch thick woven tapestry that you could have put a wild horse on each corner and the power of those wild horses could not have ripped that veil in two. And yet, you remember when Jesus Christ died on the cross, what happened to the veil? It was ripped. And it's important. I was talking to somebody about this a few days ago. They said, was it ripped sideways? I said, no, it was ripped top to bottom. What is that indicating? God did it. God did it. So that veil was protecting the Holy of Holies. But you know what the veil really was doing? It was protecting you. It was protecting the high priest. It was protecting somebody from going back there accidentally into the presence of God. And now what God's saying is, there's no longer any barrier between me and you. Come on in. Enter into the Holy of Holies. Enter into the presence of God, and you can do it every day. In fact, you can dwell there. You can walk there in the presence of God. The veil was ripped top to bottom. I don't have an answer for the next question I'm going to ask, but over the last few years, I've been asking this question. What did they do with the veil? You ever thought about that? What did they do with it, Jack? Keith, you got any idea? Here's what I'm afraid they did with it. I'm afraid they sewed it back together. Why? Because to be a Jew meant that protected you from the wrath of God. That protected you from the presence of God. That protected you from the power of God. So you couldn't go through life without something keeping you from the Holy of Holies. I think maybe they cranked up the sewing machines and sewed it back together and put it back up. We don't have to put it back up. Because we have a new and living way through the body of Christ. He's the veil that we enter into that was His flesh. Our confidence, secondly, is in Jesus. I don't have confidence in my flesh. I don't have confidence in my ability. I don't have confidence to live the Christian life apart from Jesus. But our confidence is in Jesus. Therefore, since, we get to the second sense in verse 21, since we have a great priest over the house of God, Jesus is our new high priest. Fulfilled all of the Old Testament law. Since we have this great priest, here's the first of the lettuces. Let us draw near with sincere hearts and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us draw near, literally to approach, to visit, to worship, to draw near. With a sincere heart, a true heart, a genuine heart, a real, full of conviction heart. With the full assurance of faith. No doubt to the access. Have you ever sensed you couldn't walk in a place? My mom, I don't remember exactly where we were going in, but there were several times we were going in places we probably shouldn't have been, and my mom would always say this, walk in like you own the place. You ever heard that? I'm not real sure what that means. Walk in like you own the place. but I can come into the presence of God like he owns the place. And I can have assurance there. I don't have to stay quiet. I don't have to stay timid. One of my heroes growing up was a golfer named Jack Nicklaus. Perhaps you've heard of him. I kept a scrapbook on Jack Nicklaus. He was my hero. I wanted to be Jack Nicklaus. My friends knew he was my hero. One year in my 20s, I was at a practice round at Augusta National for the Masters. We were at Amen Corner. Some of you have been there. Right there in between the 11th green and the 12th tee, there's a television tower. It started raining. There's more to this story that I won't tell you, but it started raining. And so we ducked under the television. First one's under there, ducked under this television platform, and we're getting out of the rain. Next thing I know, I heard somebody say, you mind if I get under here? You know who it was? Jack Nicklaus. (laughs) 
he was playing a practice round with a guy named Calvin Pete, and they got under there with us. Well, all of a sudden, everybody from Amen Corner got under there too. You know what? None of them got under there because I was under there. But they saw Jack Nicholas duck under there, and I'm standing this close to Jack Nicholas, and I didn't say a word. People were asking him stupid questions. Somebody said, how many golf balls do you play, play around with? He said, however many it takes. It's pouring down rain, everything's wet. Somebody said, would you sign my hat? <laughs> he said, well, let's wait till things dry off a little bit. After the rain stopped, it, it had been a few minutes, he walked out, and my friends looked at me and said, that was your hero. Why didn't you talk to him? You know why I didn't talk to him? I didn't feel worthy to talk to him. I didn't want to bother him. I'm a nobody. He's a somebody. But I now am a somebody. I can come into the presence of God with full assurance of faith. Why? Because my heart has been sprinkled clean. That's again Old Testament imagery. They would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. And so the Hebrews that are hearing this word, all of this is bringing up imagery that you and I miss because we don't get it. We, didn't, we weren't raised in that environment, in that tradition. But my heart's been sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. There's no condemnation for me anymore, so quit, quit condemning yourself. My body has been washed with pure water. So draw near. Let's get practical. I mean, how do we draw near into the presence of God? One is, is prayer. You have access to the throne room of God. Do you know you can pray and talk to the God of the universe? And you know what? He hears you. Isn't that incredible? And yet one of the most neglected disciplines in all of Christian life is prayer. I'm guilty. I don't pray enough. One of the things I've learned is I get, I've got ADD, Jack. I mean, I had it before it was, they had letters to identify. It. I can get distracted in a heartbeat. How about you? Are you do you ever times in prayer that your mind wanders? You know what I've learned? It may be God talking to you. Prayer is not a one-way street. It's communication with the God of the universe. So I started keeping a notebook, and if God put something on my mind, I would write it down so I could forget it then and finish the prayer and come back to it later instead of being distracted. But I, I finally realized prayer is more than just me verbalizing things to God. Sometimes in prayer, I need to be quiet. So draw near. One way we draw near is through prayer. Another way is Bible study. God's written us a letter. 66 books, Old Testament, New Testament. How much time are we spending reading the love letter from God? Draw near. Bible study. Personal Bible study. Corporate Bible study. Being a part of a small group. Being a part of a men's group. A ladies group. Being in church where you're hearing the word of God preached. And then worship. Draw near in worship. I wish I had the worship team come to my house every morning and wake me up so I could sing to God. They're probably not going to do that. But you can worship God by turning on the radio in your car or having an iPad or an iPhone with some music on it. But music's not the only way we worship. Music, worship is ascribing worth to God. Our favorite way of doing that is through music, but you can read the book of Psalms, the last five chapters especially. And just worship God. So draw near. Therefore, since this is true and since this is true, he's building a case. Since all this is true, let us, first let us is draw near. So our confidence is in Jesus. Second let us is let us hold fast. I want you to make a fist. Some of you say, I'm, I'm not doing this. By the way, this is live. I'm actually here. You're not watching this on video, so I can see whether you're doing it or not. Make a fist. What are you holding on to? What I want you to think about before you leave here today is we're holding on to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. You can let go if you're uncomfortable. But God teaches me things through my own children. There's times I wonder, what am I really holding on to? We had four children, two girls and then two boys. The two boys were baptized in this baptistry. Our youngest, well, actually our second, first son, so our third child, his favorite thing in the world was rocks. He would, he would just have rocks in his pockets all the time. 
If you ever visited our house, it'd be a pile of rocks because we wouldn't let him bring him in. His name's Robbie. Robbie, you got to put them rocks right there. He so there always be a pile of rocks at the front door. My son Gabe, his favorite thing was a stick. He could make any toy, batteries not required, he could make any toy with a stick. It could be a javelin, it could be a scepter, it could be a sword, it could be a rocket. He loved playing with sticks. If you came to my house, there's going to be a pile of rocks and a pile of sticks. We were at a church softball game watching my wife play softball. And I'm watching the kids run around, watching her, watching the kids. Gabe had come out of the woods dragging a tree. I'm serious. And he was holding on one of the limbs and said, Dad, break this off for me. I thought, I don't have a chainsaw. How am I going to break that off? But, you know, I'm Dad here. I'm I'm the hero. i got to do it. So I'm over there trying with all my might. And and the crowd has quit watching the game. They're watching me, cheering me on. Break it, Robert. All of a sudden, I hear a snap. I think it was one of the bones in my leg. And I handed him that stick. He was so proud. He carried that thing around the rest of the night. When we got in the van to go home that night, he said, Can I take this home? I said, you're doggone right you're taking it home. You're probably going to sleep with it tonight after everything I went through. But no, we made him leave that at the door. But he had an inside stick. He had a dial rod, part of which I'd used for some reason. I had this dial rod. So he would put on his blanket like he was Moses or something and go around ordering us around with his rod. I remember one time he walked up to his sister and said, eat your cookie. (laughs) We're watching TV one night. He's swinging this thing around. And what do parents learn to say if you've got a stick in your hand? Be careful, you might put your eye out. Thanks for participating. And so I went up to Gabe and I said, Gabe, give me the stick. And here's what I saw. He's probably two, two and a half years old. He's got a death grip on that stick and he said, "Uh -uh." uh-uh. you got to be careful with two-year-olds because what will they do if you try to take away something from them? Two things. Cry or they might bite you. But you know what? God teaches me through moments like that. Here's what I heard God tap me on the shoulder and say, that's how I want you to hold on to your faith. Because you have confidence by the word of God that you can enter the holy place, but you also have an enemy that is going to constantly be in one of your ears saying, you don't deserve to go there. God doesn't really love you. Check your life out. You're not worthy. And how many times has he seen me say, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not letting go of the confession, the confidence of my hope. I'm not letting go. And why do I not let go? I'm glad you asked that question because he answers it. Hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. It means not leaning, but it means standing firm because he who promised is faithful. See, I'm not the only one holding on to hope. He's holding on to me. I want you to get this visual image. It's not just by your strength you're holding on to hope, but he's made a promise. In fact, it's a similar word. You've made a confession of hope. I believe in Jesus. But Jesus is holding on to you. And what does Jesus say? Nothing can snatch you out of my Father's hands. I will never leave you or forsake you. How are you doing in hope these days? Y'all, this has been a time for the world that has been a hopeless time for many people. If you don't have Jesus in your heart, I don't know how, you, how you're making it. You're worried about the, the virus. You're worried about, do I get the vaccine? Do I not get the vaccine? What if I get sick? I've lost friends to this virus. I hate it. But I still have hope. I have hope, first of all, that those believers who've died of the virus have gone to be with the Savior. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I believe that. But I also believe this. It's not just my strength that's holding. It's God holding on to me. Because His promise is faithful. Has God ever made a promise He didn't complete? Has God ever let you down? And the answer is absolutely not. So our confidence is in Jesus. And then last, our confidence should be shared. Last, let us. We've had let us draw near. We've had let us hold fast and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Let us consider. It it literally means to observe fully. It means to give concentrated thought. And who are we considering? One another. 
That's the great thing about the church. That's the thing we've missed during COVID with folks who are not been able to go to church. They're watching online, and you can hear great sermons online. You can also hear some bad ones. But that's not the church. The church is the body of Christ. It's the ecclesia. It's the called out ones. And we've missed that during these days. And I'm glad we're getting back to that because we need each other. God will use other people in your life to encourage you, to strengthen you, to help hold you accountable, perhaps to share Christ with you, to bring you to faith. But for believers, we need each other just for encouragement. We're on this path together. What you're going through, I'm going through too. And I'll pray for you. So stimulate one another. It literally means, some translations say, to spur one another on. And I have to share this for teenagers in the audience. That doesn't mean spur like a Western where you're kicking people. It means to incite to good. How do I do that? Let me just give you some practical ways. One way that I spur one another on is through prayer. To, to let somebody know, hey, I'm praying for you. I prayed with a guy last week who's dealing with cancer. And I visited, had visited with him for over an hour, and I finally said, let me pray for you. And when I finished praying, I looked, and there were tears in his eyes. You and I sometimes miss the prior, power of prayer because we take it for granted. But there's people out there in the world just to know you're praying for them will impact their life. It may be your waitress at the restaurant. Most of them are going to ask, waiters or waitress, how are you doing? Apparently, very few of them ever get asked, how are you doing? Because I'll have them ask me, act surprised sometimes. I'll say, I'm fine, how are you doing? had one in Gaffney one time tell me, she said, how are you doing? I said, I'm fine. How are you doing? She said, well, my goat died today. I've never had that response. I didn't say it, but I thought it. Hear me now. I didn't say this, but I thought, well, I hope you're not serving that on the menu. That's just how my mind works, but I'm not going to be insensitive. But you can say, let me pray for you. And very seldom, it happens occasionally. Somebody says, no, I don't need you to do that I don't believe in that but most people appreciate the fact you would actually take time to pray for them and if you pray for them let them know you prayed for them if somebody says hey pray for me and you pray for him later that week or them that later that week send them a text send them an email make a phone call leave a voicemail write a letter praying for you how do we stimulate one another another way is through example we can show people how we're walking with Christ. Some of that is better caught than taught. So set a good example. How do we stimulate one another? Through God's Word. Sometimes just a passage of Scripture at the right moment or a verse, God will use that to encourage, to stimulate. The last one's encouragement. Send notes, calls, visits, text, emails. Love and good deeds. Why do I need to be stimulated to love? And why do I need to be stimulated to do good deeds? Hear me, neither one of those come natural. It is not humanly natural for me to love you. Unless you've done something for me, apart from Christ, I'm probably not going to love you. But that's not real love. To love like Jesus loves, it means you love somebody even if they haven't done something for you. Sometimes I have to pray this prayer, God, help me see them the way you do so that I can love them the way you do and the way you want me to. Good deeds. Why do I need to be encouraged at good deeds? Because that doesn't come natural either. I've heard secular humanism teach this. If you leave a child alone, he or she will have a tendency to do the right thing. I actually heard somebody say that. Left alone, they'll have a tendency to do the right thing. I got four children. I got to tell you, that isn't true. It comes natural to do the wrong thing. Nobody had to teach my sons to pull their sister's hair. Nobody had to teach my daughters to hide their brother's toys. We need to be encouraged to love and good deeds. And he says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the habit of some. Why do people abandon church? Some of it's laziness. I just can't get up that early. You get up that early for everything else in your life. I can't get up that early. Some will use the excuse today, well, you know, it's daylight savings time. But you know what? I hear the same excuse in October. I don't understand that. I couldn't come to church, you know, that daylight savings time messed me up. You got an extra hour of sleep, it's October. Or November now. 
lot of people abandon church, other pursuits, things like recreation, the things of this world. There have been people that used to be faithful in church and they find themselves now, well, I worship God at the lake. Can you worship God at the lake? Yeah. But that ain't in the church. So why do some people abandon church? They're mad at somebody. That church, they're nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. You're right. That's why we have church. You still go to the grocery store, there's hypocrites there. That hasn't stopped you from eating. Why do people abandon church? Persecution. The people that the author of Hebrews is writing are experiencing persecution. And folks, we're experiencing persecution and it will get worse. And some people will abandon meeting together because of persecution. Do you know on planet earth right now, there's churches meeting underground. There are churches that have to whisper. There's churches, but they're still meeting. Why? Because that's the church. It's really difficult to encourage and stimulate one another from a distance. You need to be up close and personal. Somebody put it this way. We need to be Jesus with skin on. I'll close with this illustration. In order for me to encourage you, I've got to get close. Even in the midst of COVID, that's hard to do. But we can still at least be within eyesight. Sometimes you just need a hug. Sometimes you just need to know somebody's close enough to care. When we lived in Gastonia, we lived in an old house. It was about 80 years old. We were restoring it. And at night, sometimes when those thunderstorms came up, lightning would flash, thunder would hit, and the whole house would shake. And our daughters were across the hall from our bedroom, both of them in the same bedroom in these days. And our older daughter said, Dad, I'm afraid. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid of the thunder. And sometimes just telling a joke would get her to go to sleep, and I'd say, well, you don't have to be afraid of thunder. If you hear thunder, it means you weren't hit by the lightning. Thunder is our friend. It's a good thing. But that wasn't helping this night. I walked and stood at the door and helped, put my hand on the door frame and said, your sister's in here with you. You're not alone. She said, yeah, but she's asleep. In her mind, once you went to sleep, you've left the planet. You're of no useful good to her anymore. And I found that if I went and knelt by her bed and just held her hand, she was asleep like that. Why? Because she just needed to know somebody cared enough to get close. I want to encourage you during these days of hopelessness in some people's lives. We need to let us give concentrated thought of how to spur one another on, how to help people down the path to be more like Jesus. And it's interesting how he says, closes it. Encourage one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What day is he talking about? The return of Christ. I've had people say, do you believe that COVID is a sign of the end times? Yeah. The verse we quote out of Second Chronicles is, if my people who are called by name would humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, pray, seek my face. Have you read the verse right before that? I don't know that I ever had until this year. I know I had because in seminary you had to. But it says before that, if I withhold the rain, God speaking, if I do this, if I send a pandemic, that's the literal word in the translation, if I send a pandemic and my people who are called by my name. Somebody said, do you think we're close to the return of Christ? My answer is we're closer than we've ever been. Could it happen tomorrow? I don't know. I'm not going to set a date. But I know this, God's saying, as the day draws near, encourage one another. In other words, this, live like Jesus would live. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the encouragement we find in Scripture and even the encouragement we find from one another. Lord, I pray for men and women, young people watching this over the Internet. I pray for folks who are in this room this morning. If we were honest, some of us would say, I've really been struggling with hope. My confidence is shot. My faith is strained. God, I pray this morning is a reminder that our hope is not in ourself. It's not in our government. It's not in the healthcare system. Our hope is in Christ who has promised 
that he would never leave us or forsake us. He has promised that nothing could snatch us out of the Father's hand. So Lord, I pray this morning that we are encouraged with that, but it doesn't stop there. Lord, as we are encouraged, help that become contagious to the folks around us. That they would see the reason for the hope that was within us. And they would be encouraged. For some, they would come to faith in Christ because there's nowhere else to turn. For others who are believers, it would restore in them their faith, their confidence, their hope. They would realize that Jesus is holding on to them. So Lord, during this time of invitation, have your way in us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close. This is our hymn of invitation. This altar is open if you'd like to come and pray. Brother Robert and his wife and I will be in the back of the church if you'd like us to pray with you for any reason. If you want to know more about who this Jesus really is and come to know him, we'd love to meet you back there. But as we sing, you pray and you come and join us.
Lord, thank you for this day and for the sermon that we've heard. Will we just live with that confidence in, in you um, and in unity and the bond of peace with each other as we go? Thank you for this day. We ask all of this now in Jesus' name. Amen.